This is Nightlore by Ultimate Play the Game. In my opinion, one of the best games ever written from 1984. Let's load it and today's episode uh, of Understanding Computer Sound is all about ZX Spectrums. Once this finishes loading, uh, you will hear a melody, intro melody for Night Lore, which is a counterpoint effect, bass line played along with the treble line interchangeably, one note from bass, one note from treble. The effect was discussed already before when we talked about Apple II, uh, remember the Frogger game, the same counterpoint effect was used there. Uh, let's listen to it. It should l stop loading very shortly. I think. Uh, it takes much longer than I remember. perfect example of counterpoint effect used in night lore and to be honest it's difficult not to become nostalgic i i promised uh, that i will not uh, make any nostalgic comments here but i have to make one like uh, zx spectrum was one of my what was my first computer actually not zx spectrum this one zx81 was the first computer that i've ever used ever typed on ever played a game on and ever programmed on and I was uh, seven or eight back then. Uh, we'll not be talking about the ZX88 here, uh, 81 here, because it doesn't have the sound capability by default. Uh, there were, uh, there are uh, ways of making it make sound, and we can uh, spend a different video on that. But uh, by default, it didn't make sound. It was uh, completely silent. Uh, whereas the ones that are here are actually meant to make sound. Uh, so, what I have here on my desk is ZX uh, uh, Spectrum 48K, uh, ZX Spec Spectrum Plus, and ZX Spectrum uh, Plus 2 128K. This one actually has more advanced sound capabilities. It has an AY chip built in, but we're not going to talk about the AY chip here. We're going to use it in plain 48K, 48K mode. Um, basically meaning that it can only output one bit sound. All these computers can only output out bit sound um, for the purposes of our video. That's how we're going and that's what we're going to talk about. We'll see how that one bit sound again when in the hands of very capable uh, programmers and musicians what it can do. Uh, but before we start uh, those very high pitched sounds that you heard uh, when the game was loading is actually also uh, uh, sound waves that were used to transmit programs from the computer to the cassette like this one to the uh, magnetic tape and back so when you whenever you loaded the game you again used high pitched sound waves to upload the uh, game to the computer the sound waves was a way to was a way to encode uh, the content of the program zeros and ones basically uh, in such a way that it can be stored on a uh, on a magnetic tape. And actually, I remember very well my early days of computing when I was a kid. Uh, we would use I, I actually used specifically this uh, old Grundig tape recorder to uh, record and to play back the games and to upload them to this 48k. Uh, computer with rubber keys. The funny thing that I think that I remember is that software was actually being played back 
on a radio so you'd go on an evening like there was a uh, there was a, a show or uh, about uh, computers and you would at certain point the presenter would say okay now i'm gonna play for you the game switch your tape recorders on switch recording on and put your recorders against the speaker or uh, you know connect them with a cable and you would switch recording and they would actually play those squeaking those high-pitched uh, unpleasant sounds so that you could record the game on your cassette and then uh, load it to your computer uh, can you imagine so this is the, this was the, the way of transmitting uh, programs back then uh, but never mind that uh, we're we're here to talk about sound the sound that you heard the intro sound to uh, night lore is uh, act was actually built using very simple square waves and zx spectrums had a built-in beep command in in uh, their basic uh, basic language interpreter uh, in rom that allowed uh, the uh, like uh, uh, you know amateur programmers anyone basically to build simple melodies uh, to show how it worked um, i uh, wrote a very simple program that will play a tune i'm not gonna i'm not gonna say what tune that is uh, you will recognize it it's a classic rock tune but uh, how it works it takes data from memory uh, the data is stored in mem memory using the uh, data command and then it takes uh, each pair of data duration and pitch uploads it to the beep command and the beep command plays in a loop it takes another pair plays again takes another pair plays again and it also displays a very simple graph of the pitches of nodes but that's uh, uh, that's irrelevant let's let's play it here and i'm going to first not play anything via the amplifier because i want to show you how faint how quiet was the built-in speaker it wasn't like uh, really really powerful at all uh, let me play it run not sure if this can be heard at all maybe now so this is the sound from from the actual speaker it's underneath i don't want to ruin my setup here but uh, it wouldn't be any louder i hope you already recognize the tune so now what we're gonna do we're going to play it so these are all beep sounds very simple square wave you can see it it's not square why it's not square we'll talk about in a moment but let me break that and show you something more interesting so we're gonna play the same tune using exactly the same code the same basic program that i wrote for the purpose of this video and we're gonna play it on the zx spectrum plus 2 as well okay and we press run at the same time in both computers and now i'm gonna play it over an amplifier listen to this ah my mistake once again wrong computer now you should hear it the tune started at the same time on both computers but listen what, to what's happening it diverged it went in two different ways and now it's completely desynchronized why is that happening okay it's now chaos let's break the program here and here why is that happening why did they not play at this with the same timing this is very important those two computers have different cpu speeds this one is 3.5 uh, megahertz i think this one 3.6 megahertz i don't remember what, but uh, I, th th there's a difference and the faster one plays the sounds faster the duration of the uh, notes is shorter so the programmers and composers had to be very careful with those early 8-bit machines to time their 
music to a specific architecture. If they moved this, the program to a faster one, it would play faster and the effects would be slightly different. So they, they, they had to be very careful to time the, the, the execution of the program to the exact, uh, uh, the exact frequency and speed of the CPU. This is actual real-time computing. It's called real-time computing. Basically, the software has uh, strict, very strict time uh, constraints, uh, and the programmer has to think about the time constraints when building their, their software. Now, uh, I had some fun uh, adjusting the faster computer I, uh, by uh, adding multiplication to the duration. Let me try and quickly show you. So if I go to instruction number 30 and edit it and add multiplication by mm, 1.015 that's what I figured after a lot of experiments. Yeah, and if we now run them at the same time, look what we hear. The Durations are now correct. You see, the, those two tunes are, are not diverging anymore. But we did not fix the problem of frequencies of notes themselves. So what you hear is a very pleasant buzzing in your ear. It's called the detune effect, or or they, they are playing in unison. So we can say it's unison, but the, the, the buzzing effect, the sort of wavy effect that you hear, which is very pleasant to hear, is the detune effect. That, uh, that effect uh, is used by many musicians uh, on purpose. But here is, of course, a side effect of tools to uh, ZX Spectrums having different CPU frequencies. Now, look at the wave here. I mentioned uh, that all these are square waves. Does it look square to you? It does not. We touched upon the subject of why square wave doesn't look square in, uh, when we're, we're discussing Apple II. But now let's uh, look a little bit more into the subject and uh, let's see uh, why they are not square uh, by uh, using the example of our uh, ZX Spectrums. The original ZX Spectrum can output sound either via the built-in speaker or via a 3.5 ear or mic socket. If we look at the schematics, it is clear that there are more capacitors and resistors on the path from the EULA chip to the ear or mic sockets than there are on the path to the speaker. In case of the speaker, the signal from EULA goes straight to a transistor which applies 9 volt to the speaker. As for whether to choose ear or mic, even though there are differences between how these sockets are driven and the levels of output on each of them, for the purposes of this article we can consider them equivalent. For my experiments the amplifier was connected to the mic socket. In any case, for either ear or mic, there are capacitors and resistors on the way, which degrade the rectangular signal. That degradation does not affect audible qualities, and actually the amplified signal sounds much better than via the tiny speaker, but it affects the shape of the wave as displayed on the oscilloscope. Here is what it looks like in practice. Check out this simple basic code which plays a single pitched one tenth of a second sound, pauses it for one fiftieth of a second, plays the sound again, and so on. If we look at the oscilloscope representation of the sound produced by this program, we can see the differences between where we actually measure the signal. In these images, showing a single square pulse and the entire pulse train respectively. Blue line represents the signal as coming from the EULA chip, while the yellow line represents the signal in the 3.5 mm socket. The differences in how fast we can bring the signal up or down and how we can maintain it as the time goes are obvious. 
Now that was the explanation of why square waves are not really squ square. And now let's see in practice how developers and musicians use that to uh, create very interesting um, effects. Uh, as we said, beep sound, the one that was built in into basic language command, uh, basic language interpreter, only allowed square wave uh, uh, to be played, basically switching the uh, speaker on and off. Now, using the phenomenon that we described uh, uh, with when explaining why square wave is not really square, uh, square using the knowledge that there's capacitance in electronic components and that there's inertia in the speaker itself, in the speaker cone, there could be very, very interesting effects produced by very rapidly switching uh, that uh, speaker on and off. Before we go into how that was done in machine language, let's first see how that effect exactly works, why our ear hears very complex sounds from those simple ZX Spectrum 1-bit um, uh, sound computers, why do we even hear polyphony? We shouldn't, we shouldn't because the, at, at a single time it can on, the, the speaker can only be on and off. Well, it's possible because of all, because of the phenomenons that we described when, when talking about uh, the uh, relationship between square and non-square wave and also now uh, we'll, we're going to show it in practice. So let's see, I'm gonna play a very simple, uh, a very uh, simple demo, but which is actually a collection of songs. I'm gonna play one song out of that, Maple Reef Leaf Rag, which we already know from the Apple II uh, video, but this is a new interpretation of that uh, song by uh, uh, Richard Swan. Uh, this is from the 48 uh, Funk box uh, demo, which is displayed uh, behind me. Let's play it. Uh, it's very nice. It's very nice. Uh, I love this song, and the, the first three chords are interesting for us. Let's hear them once again. Tick, tick, tick. Let's stop our oscilloscope on those three chords. What we see here is we see the top graph on the oscilloscope, the blue one, and the yellow one on the bottom. They, the signal is from the same demo, from those three signals. Let me switch that buzzer off because uh, we don't want to be disturbed, but those three first chords, they are actually, they play two voices at the same time. Uh, I think this is uh, two notes separated by an octave, a note separated by octave, as far as I remember uh, the score for that music. But, uh, but what is interesting for us is that we tapped into the signal in two different places on the path of the sound signal. The blue graph is tapped already at the very chip that produces uh, the uh, sound output in ZX Spectrum, which is called the ULA, ULA, ULA uh, chip, uh, made by uh, Ferranti. That chip was responsible for switching the signal on and off. It was driven directly by the CPU, so we often say, hey, by the, the speaker is driven directly by the CPU. But th there was this ULA chip in the middle of that. And what I did is the blue line is actually tapped right to the pins of that ULA chip. So it's exactly where the sound or where the signal for the sound originates. Uh, I uh, led two small wires into the ch ULA, ch ULA chip. Uh, I connected the probe there and you see that the square is that that the signal is almost rectangular square like there are certain distortions at the bottom of it but if you look at the whole of it it's a rectangle it's a rectangle so the signal oscillates between high and low constantly high and low high and low and it always reaches this high and, and low now the bottom line here the the yellow graph 
is not connected directly to ULA. It is connected at my mixer here, right at the entry of the signal to the mixer. So we may uh, actually exclude the mixer from the equation. Let's say it's connected to the end of the cable going from the ZX spectrum to the mixer. The cable is not connected directly to that ULA chip. It goes through, uh, it's, it, it actually is connected to the mic uh, socket here and the mic socket is not directly connected to ULA chip either. It is directed via a few uh, capacitors and a few uh, resistors as far as I remember. Prob maybe even one transistor to uh, drive the signal or maybe transistor is only for the, the speaker. But anyway, what I'm saying is that there's there are a few electronic components on the way to the socket then there is the cable going to the mixer and then in right in the entry of the mixer we tap uh, we tap into that signal look what all those electronic components cables wires do to the signal the signal is not rectangular anymore it goes up and down up and down it it undulates it it creates a wave a new wave so this is our square wave you know on and off on and off on and off but this you see there's undulation here visible it creates a square uh, it's it creates uh, uh, an almost like analog like wave so you see there there's peaks here there's troughs there's uh, uh, there's slopes and if you look at the uh, magnif uh, magnification here, it's one millisecond per square. So, so you know, a length like that already creates an audible wave. So, what we're creating here, the, these individual uh, individual blocks or uh, uh, pulse trains may not be audible, but the resulting wave that we have at the end of the cable is already undulating. It's it creates an audible uh audible wave but we're not stopping here under the table where my large speakers are i can show you that like my uh, uh, my zoom uh, my uh, my lens is not showing enough of 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 the scene here but under the table i have two large really large speakers and i put in front of them uh believe me or not uh an, a microphone and that microphone is connected to a new channel here so let me switch the output of that microphone to the oscilloscope probe and let's see what the microphone registers so we're still looking at the three initial chords of maple leaf rack we're still looking at the signal directly from ULA chip Ferranti ULA chip but now the bottom line will not represent what we see at the end of the cable it will show us what we hear from the speakers. It will show us what the microphone picks up there. And it, it's a great proxy for what our ear receives. Let's try. I have to make the amplifier really loud to pick up something meaningful on that line. Let me see if we can do that. Let's play that. And it has to be loud. Okay, you already see the bottom line starts to wave a little bit. And let's try and stop it at something meaningful. Yep. There it is. There it is. Beautiful. This line here is not square anymore. This line is a really nice analog-like line. And that plot represents the sum of multiple sine functions that are in play here sine and not only sine and what it represents is actually a mix of two sounds let me stop playing here we don't need that anymore it represents the the smaller undulations the smaller uh, uh, the smaller waves the more frequent waves are the higher sound of those two played for the maple leaf, leaf rack for the initial two three chords and the uh, less frequent the more expanded undulation is the lower sound of it so what we're seeing here is that out of the square wave pulse trains by carefully timing them we're building initially 
uh, you know, sort of mix of square and uh, uh, and analog wave uh, on the end of the cable, but when it comes out of the speaker, it's actually not doesn't look digital at all. It's an analog wave, which is a mix of multiple frequencies. A mix of multiple frequencies, as we know from Fourier, trans Fourier transform, is basically a sum of um, uh, of function, a sum of um, frequencies, and it's plotted as a sum of uh, uh, sine waves and here you see exactly that uh, in play very interesting uh, phenomenon and this is what is used for uh, building very interesting audio effects by uh, by zx spectrum uh, or other one-bit computer programmers um, and uh, and musicians let's uh, listen to one more example i'm going pl to play let's switch back to to our uh, initial setup and I'm going to play music from the from this very game from uh, Sanction and let's see how that works that's not what I want I want number two this piece of music was composed originally by uh, uh, Rob Hubbard, uh, the legendary com musician uh, which, uh, we, who composed uh, music for C64 games. This is an adaptation of that Ron Hub uh, Rob, Rob Hubbard's uh, music uh, made by, I think, let me see, I'm not sure if we have them. Yeah, I think we have the names here in the cassette. Uh, it's adapted by Wally Bemben, and and at the end of of the music there are three. There, there's like a very high pitched sound which I want to focus on. This is actually amazing music. And listen now. Okay, let's stop the oscilloscope there and let it play. What I showed previously on maple uh, leaf rag now visible even better. This is square, this is rectangular. This is already undulating at the end of our cable. This is how audible wave is being created. You see that in action. And now let's switch to our microphone that is connected directly like this it's in front of our speakers and now we need to make it again very loud i may i'm gonna make it very loud at the end of those uh, at, of that of that piece of music when the sound go, goes very high because otherwise i'll wake up all my neighbors so let's wait and by the way enjoy this piece of music isn't it great Now it will go higher and higher. Okay. Yes, on the third try I managed to do that. Look, I caught that wave. So there are, there is a, you've heard that bass buzzing sound. That's the less frequent wave. That's the one. You heard that very high pitched sound that was separated by several octaves from the other one. That's the fine wave here. So you see Fourier's transform in action. Sum of two waves represented here as a single plot. Uh, isn't this great? Let's uh, proceed now I th to how we actually code that, uh, that kind of music in machine language. It's not that simple, but it's actually also very, uh, very fascinating. The simple sound is, is actually uh, simple to program. Let's see how that's done, because you can't do that in BASIC. You cannot, because BASIC is too slow and it produces only square wave. 
Now let's see how the programmers did that in machine language. Let, let's experiment uh, with that. I used PASMO cross compiler to build the examples discussed here and then run them on real ZX spectrums. Let's start by visualizing the quantum of rectangular wave sound, that is the flip between the only two possible states, on and off. In ZX spectrum architecture, this is achieved by flipping the fourth bit of a certain value from 0 to 1 on from, or from 1 to 0 and sending that value to the output port 254. This is what a single flip sounds like. And let's compare it with two subsequent flips, one right after another. Listen to what these two flips sound like. They were recorded at exactly the same volume as the single flip earlier. Let's compare them side by side. The dramatic decrease in volume results from what we discussed before. The inertia of electronic components and the speaker itself, which is unable to reach the full in or out position before the next flip is executed. Compare the oscilloscope view of both of these pieces of code. First, notice how long it takes between EULA sets the signal to high, which is the left-hand side red line, to when that flip starts occurring at the end of the cable running from the mic connector, that is the right-hand side red line. That's already a 2 microsecond delay which will only increase before the signal reaches the amplifier and the speaker, and before the speaker cone moves. Second, notice how slow the yellow line is to rise to the high level compared to the blue line. This is the result of the capacitance and inertia we talked about earlier. Next, examine the two red lines in this image, which represent the time span between the two flips. ZX Spectrum Zilog Z80 CPU performs 3.5 million cycles, so-called T-states, per second. That's 0.28 microsecond per cycle. The XOR instruction performed after the first flip takes 7 cycles to complete, and the OUT instruction following it takes 11 cycles to complete. The total of 18 cycles equals 5.0 for microsecond, which is the distance we see between the red lines. Lastly, compare the yellow lines between the left and right images. When we flip once, the yellow line reaches, with a delay, the high signal level, here corresponding to approximately one volt of potential difference. However, when we flip in a quick succession, even though the blue line goes all the way to the high level, the yellow one never reaches the highest state and starts falling once it has barely touched 0.6 volt level. The yellow line, that is the mic line signal, is slower, has lower amplitude and has smoother shape. Lower amplitude corresponds to lower volume and the relative slowness and smoother shape allows programmers to cheat the human ear into believing it is hearing analog sound waves. Now, we explained single or double tick of the speaker in machine language. Now, let's move to continuous sound and uh, let's see uh, how that sounds in, uh, in ZX Spectrum. Uh, first, let's play it uh, one by one, the, the uh, continuous flips. Uh, using this uh, little machine uh, language piece. Uh, all of the uh, uh, machine language code, actually any code, uh, you can find uh, in the article linked below this video. If uh, you don't have enough uh, time to look at it on the screen, you can uh, study it later. So let's look at continuous sound by playing those little ticks in a loop, in a very simple uh, machine language loop. Mm. Now, these are ticks played in a loop. Do you find this sound continuous? Well, it is continuous. Do you find it clean? It is not. It's sort of blippy bloppy. It's uh, uh, a bit uh, rough. Let's interrupt it. The reason is that ZX Spectrum continuously 
looking for is look continuously watching for interrupts from the keyboard or from other sources and it's not playing the sound super continuously there are breaks in that loop it's uh, it waits a little bit of time then it continues playing there's a specific time of waiting for that uh, within that loop but it doesn't matter for now what I want to say is that this is important to the whole concept of playing sound when while executing other things on the computer so there has to be there have to be interrupts we can disable those interrupts in the code and when i now load a piece of code exactly the same with one exception we disable interrupts we disable looking for those interruptions uh, from the user let's play it now you hear now the sound is now continuous look at the wave here by the way okay and look at the wave previously with that interrupt now if you decrease you see continuous spaces here like continuous uh, breaks pauses these are the uh, uh, this is the uh, time for uh, when the computer is listening for interrupts now uh, the whole idea of interrupting sound to do something else was intrinsic intrinsic to the all the computers that uh, drove the uh, speaker by the cpu because if you wanted to do something else you had to stop playing music it, it was either this or that and that was the origin of what is called blip blop or blippy bloppy sound of the zx spectrum and that effect was not only a side effect for games but also many uh, artists used it used it as an artistic as a, as a means to uh, achieve artistic uh, effect uh, let's listen to one of the demos uh, that i have here let me see which piece is that this one so it's a demo from international vodka party from 2018 and the piece of uh, music that i want to show is uh, was written by gasman one of the uh, you know key figures in uh, chip uh, chip scene uh, for the zx spectrum and it's called uh, summer of 69 well obviously it's uh, summer of 69 cover by the uh, cover of the famous song by uh, brian adams but let's listen to it I hope it can be heard well. This is the essence of the blip to gloppy sound of ZX Spectrum. There are const continuous interrupts in the music. I'll let you listen for a moment before I uh, continue. Okay, enough of this. Uh, look, look at the pauses between uh, pieces of sound. So there's a piece of sound, a long pause that is longer even than the sound itself. It's here. It's over 30 milliseconds of a break, then another piece of sound. So it's as if it's uh, glued or put together from tiny little pieces of sound. And Kenneth McAlp McAlpine, uh, who wrote the uh, great book Bits and, Bits and Pieces, I think, uh, The History of Chiptune, uh, he explains that uh, a lot. And there's a name for that. It's called granular synthesis. So the sound, the whole music or tune is syn synthesized from grains of uh, sounds. Those grains of sound are, are played we hear them as contiguous sound i know it's chippy choppy it's blippy bloppy whatever you call it but it's uh it's it's continuous in in our mind but in the middle of between those in those pauses the computer was free to do something else so it was for example used in games to do some action or to take input from from the user here gasman did it on purpose he did it for the effect uh, the artistic effect and he used uh, Romford engine for that. Romford engine is specifically built for 
this kind of blip blop music and we'll be talking about engines different engines as well uh, for ZX Spectrum um, in a moment but that's that's the uh, piece about continuous sound let me interrupt that now the next stage we showed uh, we showed continuous sound built out of uh, speaker uh, ticks and we showed the machine code uh, for that now the next step uh, in, in our advancement towards uh, towards um, uh, uh, writing music uh, for ZX Spectrum in machine language is achieving polyphony so this is complex and this is actually the gist of, uh, of uh, ZX Spectrum and other one-bit music this is the holy grail how to achieve polyphony when there are uh, there's only in and out uh, state of the speaker available we already sh hinted on that we showed how the electronic components it's their capacitance their uh, resistance uh, and the uh, inertia of the uh, of the speakers contribute to creating a uh, undulated uh, smooth wave wave out of uh, square waves but now let's look into how to, to do that in um, uh, in machine code so in my article under the video you will see uh, an example that I uh, adapted from uh, Pavel Lebedev, uh, Lebedev's article there's an amazing article uh, written by Pavel Lebedev it's called uh, Mir, uh, Mir's book of Spectruma if I if my Russian is correct or the, the world of uh, uh, of ZX Spectrum sounds there's no good English translation. I, I think there's only one machine language, uh, machine translation uh, uh, available, which is terrible and you can't really make uh, much out of it. But there's a PDF in Russian. If any of you knows Russian, I don't really know Russian, but I know some bits of pieces I had to uh, really study it very closely to understand. But he, Pavel Lebedev, explains very well step by step how to build that polyphonic um, polyphony using machine language and it's a great piece I highly recommend it uh, so the piece uh, the piece of code uh, you've seen that on the screen and it's already uh, it's also under uh, underneath in my article but let's hear how it sounds so it's number seven here on my list of code yeah so I encoded four chords it's a progression of chords uh, I selected the values for uh, for for the counters uh, based on experimentation, but it sort of sounds like a progression of four chords. And, and this is the basics of it. So if I show you that on the oscilloscope, you will you will hear like again a series of square waves which are producing mm, producing uh, in our ear uh, the impression of polyphony and it's actually not even impression it's it's actual polyphony because the two sounds are not mixed on a macro level as if we as as we could call it when we saw uh, saw the you know the counterpoint effect in night lore or earlier when we studied apple II in um, uh, in frogger here it is happening on microscopic level meaning the the uh, two frequencies two voices are interchanged very frequently so how how it works let me stop that what happens is there are two counters in the code one counts one has the value for one voice and another one for another voice and those counters wait they the the program goes in a loop and it when the counter reaches zero it counts from a certain value which is uh, you know we as i said we selected based on experimentation to base to to match the sound that we wanted that counts down to zero when it reaches zero it ticks it, it zero it ticks the uh, speaker on then it counts again from top it resets and counts again and when it reaches zero it ticks again there's a that a second uh, counter that does the same but independently so both counters are being read with every single loop whichever reaches zero ticks whichever reaches zero again ticks so those ticks happen independently so uh, the the frequencies that we build out of those constant ticking are interchanged 
or interwoven constantly, constantly. And uh, that's why the method of, that, the, of the, this uh, polyphony synthesis method is called pulse interleave method. And one, it's one of the most common ones used by, uh, by musicians. Uh, of uh, uh, using using one bit uh, output machines pulse interleave method uh, there are many more and uh, if you want to explore them first of all I'm gonna list them uh, in my article I'll, I'll explore more of them and here we're only hinting on that uh, but if you want to explain like, really good explanation of them uh, uh, in a very technical on a very technical level an amazing article is one uh, by Blake Troy's One Bit Instrument. I highly recommend it, uh, along with uh, the one that I mentioned before, Kenneth McAlpine's uh, Bits and Pieces. Both uh, excellent uh, reading that I highly recommend. And if you use that along with Pavel Lebedev's practical approach on how to build that in machine language, I uh, can assure you that you can build a very sound knowledge of how to write uh, music for ZX Spectrum or other one-bit machine in uh, machine language uh, code. But for now, let's see how that pulse interleave method, which I just uh, showed, uh, works worked in practice. And here is a piece by uh, uh, piece, piece that was used in a, in an old game. Actually, one of the uh, famous games from early 80s. Manic Miner. The game is, I think, from 1983. Listen to it. And look at it. Look at the waves created. Hear all the detuned effects and all the polyphony. So it's Manic Miner by Bug Bite from 1983, as we see here. And the music was by Matthew Smith who was the early, like really the pioneer of, um, one of the pioneers, along with Tim Follin, for example, of the uh, polyphony music for, uh, for ZX Spectrum. So these guys actually discovered the methods of... Uh, okay, let me... And see, here is the... Uh, here is actually uh, 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 an example of our granular music, because something is happening on the screen, but the same music is playing. Look, with all the spacing between those grains of music. Tiny little... Tiny little pieces of music that create a tune, but at the same time allow characters on the screen to move. But let me switch that off, because it disturbs us. So. Uh, so Matthew Smith, along with Tim Follin, were the were the pioneers of uh, of one bit uh, polyphony effects, and uh, their work set the sort of foundation ground for uh, future works uh, uh, future works uh, by others. Great stuff, uh, and. I mentioned detune. I also mentioned detune and unison effects later, uh, earlier when we were talking about the, the basic, uh, the piece in basic, uh, the, the little tune that I played here. Let's now spend s a little bit more time on uh, the detune effect uh, because it's actually super interesting. Let us see what happens if we take the polyphony code we just discussed and use very similar but not identical values for the counters. For example, 244 and 245. Let's listen and look at the mesmerizing oscilloscope view. The two parallel nodes are close to 90 Hz, but separated by a fraction of a Hz, maybe half a Hz or so. When they play close to unison, that is, when the waves are in phase, they look like an almost perfect square wave on the Eula pins. Blue line. The amplitude is the highest on the mic output, yellow line, and the audible underlying buzzing is the loudest. On the other hand, the further the waves go out of phase as the time passes, the more overlapping or similar frequency waves we see which in the video above can be observed as thicker and thicker switches between high and low. Of course they are not thicker, 
it's just accumulation of densely spaced pulses, which result in very fast switching between high and low, and consequently in the lowering of the perceived signals, that is, yellow lines amplitude, resulting from signal inertia which we discussed earlier. If you listen closely to this unison audio sample, preferably via amplifier and big speakers, the deep undulation, a completely new sound wave, resulting from this detune can be heard very clearly. This phenomenon is called beat frequency or beat note, and it is used both when tuning instruments and for artistic expression. To calculate the frequency of that new beat note, we need to subtract one of the simultaneous frequencies we used from another. In our case, say slightly below 90 Hz and slightly above 90 Hz, which gives us, say, slightly less than half Hz of a difference. The period of our beat wave should be slightly more than 2 seconds then, which is very much what we observe if we zoom out of the oscilloscope view. Coders and musicians very soon, or already in the early 1980s, realized that uh, the pieces of machine language code responsible for playing music, though they can be separated out into two parts. One part was the content, the values of notes, uh, specific voices, durations, etc. And the other part was the logic that was actually playing those values using the one-bit output. And that uh, logic piece um, was separated out and shared with others, and others could pre could uh, create music, even though they were not necessarily programmers or uh, were not interested in building engines, but they wanted to uh, uh, to create music uh, for, for example, for their games or other uh, demos. So that uh, logic bit was called engine, and it was shared uh, shared with others. And there, w there have been many engines created uh, since the early 1980s. Some of the earlier ones included uh, famous uh, Tim Follin's um, uh, three-channel uh, routine. Uh, and they are being created even now. Uh, some of the most prolific authors of, uh, uh, and coders of uh, those engines uh, are currently, for example, Shiro uh, from Russia or uh, uh, UTZ Illish, uh, pro uh, Illish project uh, uh, there are many, uh, many of them, but those two, two names pop up very frequently when you start reading into the subject. Uh, a great uh, description of the ZX Spectrum demo scene, the engines and chiptunes and names uh, and groups that create uh, demos uh, is in this uh, very nice book that I uh, just recently read by Piotr Marecki, Jerzmiej and by uh, Hellboy where they uh, describe the ZX Spectrum demo scene with the focus on, the, uh, on, on Eastern Europe, uh, Russia, Poland, uh, Czech Republic, Slovakia. Uh, they drop many names there, many uh, names of uh, chip tunes, many names of demos, um, and uh, and generally give us the insight into uh, into uh, somewhat maybe you know seemingly from the outside somewhat hermetic uh, subculture um, of uh, of the demo scene. Very fascinating book, um, and many names uh, of creators of chip tunes are uh, dropped there. Uh, uh, you you will often hear about Mr. Beep. You will hear about Diezmi, uh, actually the uh, the author of this book. You will, but you will also hear about Alone Coder, Busy Software, uh, uh, UTZ, uh, many others. Uh, simply because they they are very prolific uh, in their work. Amazing stuff to read, and and the pieces of music that you hear from them. Uh, it really blows my mind. I so admire some of those coders and musicians for being able to use this very limited medium and create uh, amazing pieces um, out of that. Um, and these days it's a bit easier to create chiptune thanks to again uh, some of the work uh, done by uh, by others. So we not only have different engines to cho choose from, but we also have a uh, tracker software which, are, which enables us to uh, build the tunes not by coding directly in machine language, but by 
basically inputting values into uh, columns responsible for specific voices. And those tracker, uh, uh, tracker um, uh, pieces of software, there are a few of them. Uh, there are those that are specifically meant for, um, uh, for the native uh, ZX Spectrum platform, but there are also cross-platform cl cross ones. Uh, and uh, as, as an example, to try it out and to you know, dip my toes into that a little bit, I, I tried one of those. I tried one tracker by uh, Shiro. And uh, what I did is I wrote uh, a, a chip tune myself. It's, uh, it's not great, but I'm gonna uh, play it uh, first uh, before I play the ones created by uh, much more skilled uh, musicians, just to show you what's possible. So as a comparison, the previous pieces of code that I demonstrated uh, I spent a lot of time understanding how polyphony works, uh, going through all the pa Pavel Lebedev's examples, and it, it took, uh, took hours and hours of research and uh, and uh, and you know digging into. Whereas the piece of music that I I'm just gonna show you now, I called it uh, Summer Adventure. It took less than an hour to compose, thanks to. Uh, the modular pieces of software that we have available now uh, for creating uh, chiptune music. Uh, so I used, as I said, one tracker, I used uh, an, uh, a specific engine, uh, TB pair, uh, and, and okay, let's just listen to it. I used several uh, techniques, music, musical techniques that we were discussing about, we're modulating the pulse with uh, I used uh, the drum track, I used uh, two or three voices, I don't, don't remember for now. I used arpeggios, like, have a look at that. And, and again, this is, the, to, this, is, this is to demonstrate how simple it is to create one. So this is my first chip tune. So it goes. Uh, I'm showing it not to uh, brag about my skills. Again, uh, you will see in a moment uh, the true masters uh, how they do that. Uh, but I'm showing it how simple it is these days uh, to uh, to create one. And I highly encourage you to experiment. I highly highly encourage you to take one of those cross. Uh, platform uh, tracker uh, uh, tracker uh, pieces of software and, and just try it out. Uh, so let's let's look at how uh, the real musicians, skilled uh, skilled coders, uh, do that. And let's start with looking at a demo. It's a Pyom demo. And sh sorry to be constantly uh, turning my back to you, uh, but this is how my setup is here. Uh, I have to look at the screen behind me. Um, let's look at this demo. And there's one thing I, I wanted to demonstrate here, uh, in addition to uh, you know how uh, how brilliant are the creators of this music. Uh, I'm gonna keep on repeat. I, I'll be repeating that all the time. Like the bri uh, brilliance and genius of some of the musicians is, is just amazing. But what I want to demonstrate is if I play this and if I look at the piece called Executor. Very nice tune. Uh, but what I want to show is pay attention to silence here for a change. Not to sound, but to silence. Let's play it again. Okay. And let's tap. Let's stop at the silence bit. This is silence. Look, silence here is not a straight line. Let me stop this. Okay, and let me reset that. Silence here is not straight line. The silence is constant switching 
between high and low in order to maintain the state of uh, in, t in order to maintain uh, the speaker in a specific position and in order to be able to switch quickly between frequencies but that high and low switches in silence are uh, super fast super fast just so that we don't hear them so that silence that maintaining this phantom frequency or bass frequency or uh, however we call it uh, is there uh, to be able to switch between other states uh, in a very fast uh, way and programmers did that in uh, many ways this is uh, this switch here is at around 20 kilohertz so we almost can hear it's be almost beyond the uh, range of human hearing but look at if if it wasn't done that fast it's actually very audible so let's have a look at another demo It's uh, the Mission Impossible demo, very famous one, much older. And the switching sound here is at 10 kilohertz. Have a look. Again very frequent changes very fast up and down but this time not fast enough to be inaudible so this is uh, this demo is i don't know which year 1996 uh, very nice one by the way uh, but uh, but the you, you, you see the difference between how silence is executed here Let's look at something uh, uh, very interesting now, uh, another method of achieving polyphony. And let me see uh, if we can load uh, this eight channels demo. There it is. What I want to hear here is the piece number five. nice isn't it but can you see a much different uh, display uh, much different uh, shape of the of our uh, top line here in, uh, in the oscilloscope let's start it again it's all pins individual pins very narrow pulses that are being played here and they create polyphony, they create multiple voices, uh, but the method is different than from what we discussed, from uh, pulse width modulation, from uh, pulse interleave uh, modulation. This one is called pin pulse method. It basically creates pins at individual frequencies specific for individual voices. The demo is called eight channels, so I trust them it's up to eight channels that you can use here. And you can see when the music starts, how they add channels. Look. There's first one, then the two, and there's many more in addition. Very nice one. Uh, that method, uh, pinball's method, by the way, is discussed at length uh, in Blake Royce's um, uh, article, which I which I already mentioned multiple times. Let's look at a few more pieces of music from some of the. Uh, musicians and coders that uh, I listed. So this first music is uh, by Mr. B. Very nice one. It's called Nebula Pipe. And there, there is drum track added. Drum track created a lot of problems. We'll go to that in a second. Uh, look at this one by uh, Shiro. Again, you see those little pins? Uh, pin pulse method. Creates a much more pinny, flat sound, but enables adding much more polyphony and many more effects. Um, the next one uh, we can uh, we can have a look at is uh, uh, is the chaos Constru constructions demo from 2010. 
let's load that Battle of the Beeps 2010 and the piece that I wanted to show here is number 17 low bit revolt the reason I'm showing it is using low frequency oscillation effect very nicely realized you see how, how the timbre of the, of the voice changes once again becomes flatter. This is low frequency oscillation, so very low wave modulating the entire tune. How it's realized in, uh, in one bit output uh, computers is basically by shaping the uh, pulse width. So you modulate the pulse width of the rectangular wave, that's one of the ways of achieving that. Uh, let's look at uh, another one. This is an example of sampled music. You will hear a big difference in the quality. Mm -hmm. So you have voice, human vi voice, you have music and everything else, but also a rather terrible quality. This is how sampling works. Um, it's not really working on multiple voices at a time, or not achieving polyphony, polyphony ground up. It's basically taking music, recording it, and trying to downsample it to one bit uh, using pulse frequency method this time. Uh, I'll uh, leave it up to you to judge if that sounds good or not. Uh, but again, this is a huge technical achievement. I only need to admire uh, AlsaSoft who created uh, that um, that demo. Now. I mentioned that drums were difficult to uh, achieve cleanly. Here is an example where it was done very well. It's the Archie Beeper uh, demo, uh, Archie uh, Beeper engine uh, by uh, UTZ from 2019. Listen to the, uh, to the drums, very nicely done. Now this one, uh, Chaos Constructions 2012, uh, what I want to show is one piece that has very nice clean polyphony uh, and, it, uh, and it shows what's possible, how possible it is to separate voices out so that you can discern them when listening. Very nice one. It's, uh, let me see which is that on my list, here. And this one is again by Illish Project. It's not that blippy bloppy sound, that spectrum sound anymore. It's uh, uh, it's very crisp, I would say. And also on the same demo, this one by a lone coder, Bitman. Listen to the low voices here, to the bass line. Bass line is not easy to achieve on as I expected. It was done very nicely here. And 
this one by uh, by Mr. Beep, a much earlier one, is actually super crazy. It's 2010. It's not much earlier, but 2010. very colorful as you see on the screen there's some flashing of colors while the music is playing and again can you see pimples method here <laughs> crazy crazy flat tiny drums I like it for its uh, speed and craziness let's look at another one This one, 2012 uh, by Jerzmi, and let's play number two, which shows the opposite of what we just showed before uh, for Mr. Beep. It's a full body sound, even heavy sounding, and clean separation of voices again, which I love personally. Now this one by Mr. Beep, also from 2012. Shows uh, many different engines. I'm not gonna show all of them, uh, but uh, pieces two and show, two and six show how ZX Spectrum can compete with, for example, Commodore 64, which has much more advanced um, sound processing um, chip. So, let me load the piece number two. Look, Nebula fight. I think we've already heard that, but isn't it great? This was done using the phaser one. Engine. And if we look at some others, there's also an example of hubby, uh, hubby engine. Uh, let's load number five. And you should at this point already recognize which method of, mod of modulation of synthesis is used here. here. Those tiny little narrow pins, uh, pin pulse uh, modulation, pin, pin pulse method. And finally, let me show you something super interesting. The demo is called Nine Channels and it shows it shows uh, how far the programmers can go and how many channels of music they can represent using one bit output which is supposed to have one channel only uh, nine channels is not the feathers they can go but this demo shows how cleanly separated those channels are if we go to the piece i think number one let me see nice visuals here P press M for music there it is it shows channels being switched on one after another so you can do you can recognize how many of them there are once again let's play them eight channels of music plus one channel of drums and of course again a pin pulse method to achieve that but it shows very nicely also on, on the oscilloscope look how the channels are added at different frequencies we see more and more pulse coming in we are locked on this single pulse but we see the others coming in very nice uh, i think these are all the pieces that I wanted to show uh, but this is believe me a tiny tiny little fraction of what's available I haven't shown like one hundredth of a percent of the 
uh, amazing niche demo scene that exists there. There are dozens and hundreds of programmers and uh, chiptune creators that are creating content every day. This is a lively scene. There are many forums, there are many uh, groups um, which you can uh, uh, which you can uh, track and you can, which you can follow and uh, there's, uh, there's content coming in every day. I'm fascinated by that. I know that I will spend more time uh, experimenting with chiptune uh, music. I know that I will spend more time with ZX Spectrum because, because I have fallen back in love with them uh, while creating this video. I give my huge credits to all the people that I mentioned uh, when, pre when uh, presenting this to uh, tracker uh, software creators, to engine creators, to chiptune creators, to authors of books and um, and articles. Uh, they helped me a lot and they helped me understand uh, what's possible. Our next videos will be, uh, we'll move to more advanced chips or maybe first we'll tackle the one bit output in, in a PC, in early PCs, because that's uh, uh, what uh, um, what really needs discussing as well in, as a, to, to understand development of uh, computer sound. We'll then move on to more advanced chips like AY used in this ZX Spectrum uh, Plus 2. We'll move on to um, the SID uh, chip in uh, C64, to the Pokey chip in Atari. And we'll move on and progress, but. Uh, but I'm leaving the ZX Spectrum, ZX Spectrum uh, topic highly, uh, highly um, uncovered, non-covered enough, I would say. Uh, I think we'll come back to it. Maybe we'll create a video on creating a piece of chiptune music, or maybe we'll have one on tracker software, or on engines specifically, because I only scratched the surface today. But in any case, I encourage, in any way, I I encourage everyone to try on their own to try and write a piece of chip, uh, chiptune music. You don't need the actual hardware for that. You can do that in an emulator. Uh, and uh, I encourage everyone to listen to what's possible. Uh, amazing fun. Uh, I love doing this video and I'll be coming back to ZX Spectrum, that for sure. Talk to you later.